Welcome to The Emergent Human, where we explore optimizing health, embodied spirituality, and post-conventional living. I'm Michael Osterlink, a therapist, coach, and educator, and I'm your host. Today's show is brought to you by Somatic Psychotherapy Today. A shout out to my colleague, Abby Hand, an epigenetics coach who does preconception health coaching, which focuses on optimizing the health of both parents before becoming pregnant. This may involve improving the sleep, correcting nutri nutrient de deficiencies, balancing body systems, managing stress, increasing fitness levels, reducing inflammation, and even removing exposures to chemicals, medications, and other substances that might impede the health and fertility. Today's guest is Stephen Kessler. S Stephen is a licensed psychotherapist who has been studying many different healing modalities and maps of personality, including the Enneagram with Helen Palmer, NLP, energy work, thought field therapy, and EFT emotional freedom technique, becoming a certified EFT expert and trainer. For over 10 years, he's been a student of Linda Sassara, studying character structure, the direct perception of energy, and shamanism in the lineage of Grandfather Two Bears and the Southern Seers tradition. He is the author of the best-selling book, The Five Personality Patterns, Your Guide to Understanding Yourself and Others and Developing Emotional Maturity. It's good to see you, Stephen. Why, thank you. Glad to be here. I appreciate your time. A fantastic book, which we'll get into. But uh, before we do, we talked offline. We shared JFK together. Yeah. Different time periods, different decades, actually. But I'm very fascinated by all the trainings you've done and your path. And I'd love for you to share with the audience, like what led you to eventually discover and create this system? <laughs> yeah, like I said before, it's, it's a long and winding road. Uh -huh. As I've looked back over my life, the, um, the, the sort of guiding principle seems to have been the question, what is real? What is reality? How do we know? And when I was in um, grade school and high school, um, I fell in love with physics uh, because after all, our real religion in the Western cultures is um, scientific materialism, physical materialism. We believe in the physical world and we believe that scientific method will explain that to us. And physics is kind of the priesthood of all that. They're the ones who get to say, you know, what happened in the Big Bang and what are the elementary particles and all that stuff. So I thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out about that. So I, um, I managed to get into MIT to study physics as a freshman. And um, almost immediately, I began to realize this is not going to work. <laughs> uh, because I would go to my, um, my professors and I would ask questions like, so like, what is reality? And how do we know? And, you know, is there a God? And, and they would go, Stephen, you can't ask these questions in science. This is, this is theology you're asking about. This is not science. And also, I looked around at my fellow students. And, uh, you know, we were all smart people. And we'd all done great on our SATs and stuff. But as I looked at, at my fellow students, I realized I, I'm, I'm a real mess from my childhood. But these people are worse, man. <laughs> and if I stay here, I'm not getting better. I need something to help me unwind my, my, I was wound tight as a jump, drum, I'll tell you. Um, things had not been all that happy in my childhood, and I was like, to manage it. And so I thought, okay, what else can I do? And in high school, I had always also, uh, fallen into um, doing the school plays, drama, at, which was an attempt to figure out human emotions because I, as a freshman, I went to the school play like three nights running and I was thinking, these people are having feelings I don't have. Why don't I have those? Wow. What's wrong here? So I transferred from MIT. While I was in my first year at MIT, I auditioned for the theater school at Boston University School of Theater Art, of Acting, wow. School of Fine and Applied Arts. 
And I got in there, which I later realized was pretty amazing. Um, and uh, so I started as a freshman again the next fall. And theater didn't, well, it wasn't, I was a well brought up young man on the East Coast. You couldn't ask for therapy unless you were crazy. Okay. So what else can you do? So I figured I need help getting my emotions back because I was aware I was kind of frozen inside. So I had four years of acting school and a lot of that was about relaxing your body so that you can feel. And after four years of acting school and then four years in a rep company, my mm -hmm. body finally relaxed. Can I ask you a question on that? How did you know that you were rigid? Because most people who are rigid don't know that they're rigid, especially so far back. In well, I had never heard of the character structure patterns or a pattern called the rigid pattern. Yeah. And I didn't know that what I did was different than other people did. What I did know was that as a teenager, I could look at my emotional life and the emotional lives of friends and people in the school plays and think, you know, they have feelings that I don't have. Something's wrong here. Okay, okay. Like something is cut off in me. Hmm. That was as far as I got with it. Okay. That's still really good for a young person to even have that self-reflection. I Apparently. I mean, I was doing the best I could. And I don't know where I got that idea. You know, my parents were really kind of clueless, like most parents in the 50s and 60s. So I don't know how I figured that out, but I somehow did. And then, um, like I said, in the fourth year of my time with the New England Repertory Theater, my emotions finally relaxed and opened up. And I realized, oh, this is good. This is what I've wanted, actually. Besides, I'm really not that talented as an actor, and I'm never going to make, I'm never going to go slay New York, you know? What I wanted was to get my emotions back, mission accomplished, time to move on. Yeah. So I entered a period of kind of lateral drift, which included driving a, it was a bread truck that I had rebuilt into a motor home. Ooh. Because I, I wanted to have my bed and kitchen with me as I drove across country. And um, I, had, I had not noticed that when they finally sell the bread truck after 12 years, it's pretty worn out. So everything broke on that, that trip. <laughs> and I had to wear my parents for more money to fix this and that and this. But I had a lot of time out in the wilderness, in Death Valley, in um, the, the mountains, the Sierras here in California, going up to old mines and stuff like that. And, and I was reading, um, I was reading Seth Speaks. Do you know this book? J Jane. Um, Jane Roberts. Roberts, okay. This is a, a channeled teaching from a you know, supposedly group soul about reality. And it was the first thing I'd ever read about that. And I was blown away. I mean, I'd read two pages and I had to put the book down and just like hold my head for an hour. Um, because she was talking about stuff I had never imagined. Mm. And I found myself up in the mountains outside of Death Valley at some old abandoned gold mine. And I'm like talking to the dead miners and stuff. And it's not like they're answering or anything, but I'm, I'm having, I'm being different. Mm. And um, I, I am not actually really talented psychically. You know, there are lots of people I've known who are much more talented than me, but I was at least able to, to sense there's more than just this physical world. Mm. So, um, so I sort of wandered back to Virginia, where I'd gone to high school, found out who my parents had become, um, and, uh, and gradually sort of wandered into the idea of studying transpersonal psychology, got into JFK out here and came out 
here in California to do that. How did you know about JFK and transpersonal psychology from Virginia? I don't know. Hmm. I was taking a class at Northern Virginia Community College on uh. <laughs> psychic something on telekinesis or huh. Russian Russian discoveries in um, like parapsychology type. Parapsychology, that would be the word. And maybe that led somehow, but I don't really remember. It was kind of a series of weird coincidences. Hmm. Okay. There's been a fair amount of that in my life. Well, if I remember correctly, JFK actually started out as a parapsychological school before it transitioned to J uh, transpersonal and other programs. Is that accurate? Am I misremembering? I don't actually know. I know when I got there that they, they did have a functioning parapsychology department. Okay. And they, they also had the transpersonal school, which was quite new. Okay. They had not yet graduated any students from that program, which was about two years, okay. the master's program. So, um, and I, I sort of thought I was coming out to study parapsychology. And then I realized, wait a minute, I don't want to be one of the people who studies the people who have mystical experiences. I want to have the mystical experiences. How do I do that? Where's the initiation <laughs> school? Yep. You know, I've been reading Elizabeth H's book, Initiation, about her initiation in Egypt. Hmm. I don't know, centuries, millennia ago. And um, and I was into the, like, I want to be one of these people. Like, let's go. And the JF Trey, JFK Transpersonal Department was as close as I could find, I suppose, to an initiation school. It wasn't really, but there was some really good teaching there. Mm -hmm. So I graduated from that and, and got licensed as a therapist. And, and then I started uh, sort of taking all the workshops I could along with, you know, opening my own therapy practice. Were there particular types of clients that you prefer to work with uh, above others? Um, I naturally preferred to work with adults who were actually who were interested in expanding their awareness. Okay, got it. Rather than domestic violence or addiction or, yeah. you know, yeah, because I didn't really know much about domestic violence or addiction, <laughs> um, and I. I fell into, oh, I, um, I somehow met um, Helen Palmer and started taking her classes on the Enneagram and was in her first teacher training thing. And then I, um, I discovered the uh, Diamond Heart Meditation School, the Ridwan mm -hmm. School. And that really is closer to an initiation school. They don't think of it that way, but it's the best psycho spiritual training I've ever seen anywhere. That's uh, Almas's school. That's that's uh, Almas's school. Yeah. Cool. Um, and let's see. I was in that for like sixteen years, I think. Wow. And and after a while, I noticed that I wasn't really um, benefiting from the work the way that I wanted to be and the way that some other students around me were. And I thought, okay, there's something I'm not getting here, something I need that this school doesn't have. And I had had a, um, I'd had a whole series of body workers because my, my feet had been pretty messed up actually, even at birth. And I had little uh, wedges in my shoes as a toddler. Okay which was a useful thing when it got to be 1969. Uh, Vietnam War. And Vietnam was happening and the, the lottery was happening and my draft number was 16. And they were taking the first hundred people and I didn't want to go to boot camp because I figured they will reorganize my psyche. They will reorganize my fear and anger to make me able to kill people mm -hmm. that's what they have to do as the military and I thought that won't be good for me how do I get out of this and uh, my mom said well you know we have all this medical history so I submitted that and the draft board decided okay you know uh, 
clearly combat boots will not work for you. <laughs> it also explained why <clears throat> when I had tried to go skiing, we had lived in Europe for a couple of years and, and I had tried to go skiing in Europe and boy, the ski boots hurt my feet. Wow. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. So that got clear. And then the upshot of that was that through my 20s and 30s, I had seen one kind of doctor and body worker after another trying to get my feet fixed. And, you know, the surgeons recommended surgery and everybody recommended their specialty. I had finally found somebody, a woman in Berkeley named Linda Cesara, who was the best body worker I've ever seen. Hmm. And she was able to unfreeze these bones in my foot and get them all actually mobile and working wow. together like they're supposed to. And, and then started working with me about the energy flow in my body and my awareness. And she, I'd be lying on the table and she'd say stuff like, okay, you're only in your body down to your waist. Try coming down further. And I'd be going, oh, what are we talking about? I have no idea here. <laughs> and she said, just, just imagine it. Just intend to bring your awareness down further. And she'd say, okay, now you're down to your knees. That's good. Come on down into your calves and into your feet. This was all like really weird for me. But I, um, I had her as a body worker for 15 years. Wow. And it gradually shifted from solving the, the constant pain in my feet to a whole other realms that I had no idea about. And then she started teaching a class called energy class, hmm. which scared me. And she asked me four times, four different years, like I'm teach, I'm starting a new class. Do you want to be in this? And it wasn't until the fourth time that I finally said, okay, okay, I'll do it this time. Turned out to be the right class for me. And it was in that class that I started to learn the character structure map of personality. Now I had had 20 years of Enneagram mm -hmm. and was a huge Enneagram mm -hmm. fan already. Um, but as I learned the character structure map, the thing I called five personality patterns, and as I began applying that to myself and my clients and people around me, I began to see this is more true to life. It's simpler, it's clearer, it's more accurate than any other way of understanding people I've seen. And then the last part of the story is uh, I realized no, there's no decent book on this. Yeah. You know, um, Reich's writings from the 30 are impenetrable. Um, Lowen's stuff from bioenergetics is still pretty tough. Pyroclosis is tough. With Barbara Brennan, you know, you better be able to see auras or mm -hmm. it's not going to make much sense to you. Um, so I decided it would be it would be good for me to actually bring all this teaching together and make it accessible to the general public and to psychotherapists in general. Yeah. One of the things I mentioned to you, what I really like about your book is the streams you bring together, you know, ego development, mm -hmm. trans and somatic, um, which is kind of rare in, in, in any yeah. of those fields to expand yeah. other fields. So I, I definitely appreciate that about your book. Um, <clears throat> Would you mind if we just kind of talked a little bit about the content of the book? Sure, sure. Or even your program per, uh, in general. So you talked about certain developmental milestones that every human being goes through. And if there's mm -hmm. dysfunction at any any one of them, these personality uh, patterns show up to various degrees. I thought it was really yeah. interesting, like, you know, that you it wasn't like it shows up and that's what it is. It's more like, oh, it shows up and there's a scale how it shows up inside you. exactly how caught you are in the pattern yeah. is on a spectrum so could you just briefly walk through the the stages of the development and we can talk about the different uh, five the personality structure yeah, yeah. there actually, are lots of yeah, actually before you do go oh. mind if you could talk actually as, as you share with this because in your book you also talk about that there's this essential nature to human beings yes these things are like more like body masks <laughs> That, that are put on to protect us mm -hmm, against mm -hmm. particular threats. So I'd love for you to actually talk about how you how you think about who we are without these things. 
as well as you start yeah. these things showing up to protect ourselves, if you don't mind. Sure, that's the teaching about essence and presence. Yeah. That you are your essence and your essence cannot be damaged, it cannot be injured uh, or wounded. And it is, um, every person has a completely perfect essence. But our ego structure gets between our awareness and our essence and we can't find it. We can't feel it. So a lot of the job of any kind of spiritual practice is to, um, to dissolve some of that ego, ego structure or to make it more transparent. I like the idea of making it more transparent because you still need the structure, but you don't want the, the um, obstruction so that you can then experience your own presence, your own essence directly, and then begin to compare the experience of essence to being in your personality, in your ego structure. And that the personality is sort of an attempt to replicate presence, but it's not a very good replication. Yeah, okay, thank you. I think that sets the stage nicely. I think that's re really important. And so, that comes from the Diamond Heart School. Yeah, I was going to ask you. Yeah, my question was going to ask you. You know, that, kind of, yeah, okay. That teaching, the teaching on ego psychology, the the disidentify from your inner critic, that's all from the Diamond Heart School. Great teaching that they do. Oh, all right. So the the, the developmental stages and that yeah you goes through. So lots of people have sort of divided up the developmental, the psychological, somatic development of a an infant, a child, in lots of various ways. And they all have their benefits. What I um, did was look, I, I realized that there are these five, um, these five character structure patterns or personality patterns that everybody seems to use not they don't use all five a person tends to use two of them sometimes three um i don't know anyone who's stuck in only one or anyone who uses four or five okay but um there it's only this universe of five and um as i was teaching this material in live workshops i began to realize oh i really need to test this out and make sure are there really only these five patterns and are there really only five safety strategies that are the origins of these and so i you know i i began to test that against the people that were attending the workshops and realized yeah that really only five basic safety strategies and um and then that led me to think okay so how do these why does a person develop a particular safety strategy and and like become a habit of using that mm. or not and that led me to this idea of dividing up the developmental stages into the first stage being embodiment mm. which is not handled in most um, traditional psychology we traditionally start psychology at birth but the embodiment process starts when the fetus the spirit is still in the womb mm. When the spirit is coming into the fetus and does it feel safe enough to stay and actually claim that body so embodiment being the first uh stage the first developmental task and then there's taking in taking in food taking in love this is the period of nursing mm -hmm. then it shifts and it's not a black and white shift but the emphasis shifts mm -hmm. more to putting out like the kid decides, I want this, and I'm going there, and I'm doing this. And, you know, this is when you start to get uh, conflicts with the parents about, you know, well, one of my favorite examples is if you have a kid who's only like a year or 14 months old, and they're toddling in some direction, and you look ahead and you think, oh, no, that's bad. That's going to lead to the stairs down and they'll fall down the stairs and that's, we don't want that. So you pick up your kid and you turn them. They toddle in the new direction because they were just going. 
They didn't care what direction. There was no self who could be insulted by you turned me. Mm. But after 18 months, 24 months, will and strength come online and suddenly you pick up the kid and turn them, they turn back. <laughs> yep. Because it was, no, I was going there. I have an agenda, right? The I want, I am doing thing comes online. That's the putting out, self-expression, self-action. And, you know, having that squashed is a, a whole new problem that you didn't have before. Um, so if you think about the, the patterns that rise out of these, seems better to start with the first three and, and then okay. go into the, the last two in a minute. Um, when a child uh, adopts one of these safety strategies, one of these things like, I need to do this to feel safer, because the, well, the first safety strategy from the embodiment stage is leaving, getting out. Um, when you're an infant, you can't ex exactly get up and walk away, um, but you can leave your body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the womb, the spirit can leave the fetus, can leave the body. So there is that dissociation business. Uh, so the first safety strategy is leaving, getting away from whatever is bothering you. Then starting from birth and into the nursing period, there's a different safety strategy that becomes available, and that is moving towards uh, other people, even if that's the one who is upsetting you. Mm -hmm. So this is crying out, reaching out, all the, um, the trying to get them to like you, mm -hmm. get them to come and fix the problem for you which during the nursing stage, that's all you got, yeah. you know? I'm, I'm hungry, I'm wet, I'm tired, I'm cold. I can't do anything, I need you to come and fix it for me. That's real. Third one, when will and strength come online and I want this and I am doing that starts, now we have, um, I, I have an agenda, I wanna do something and the problem arises if the parents thwart that constantly. If they punish the kid or shame the kid or humiliate the kid for trying to express themselves, and the kid realizes I can't win ever. So the only thing I can do is pull my energy in, down into my body, down even below my body and hide to try to keep myself safe. And that's called enduring. That, that pattern. was that's the enduring pattern. So first one would be leaving pattern. Second one is the merging pattern. Yep. Third one is enduring, pulling in, hunkering down, and hiding. And I think it's important because I mentioned like integrating ego development, semantics, and uh, transpersonal psychology. That this is not just like mental constructs, especially as a little baby. One, two. Oh, three, this is four. in the body. They don't have a mental self sense yet. Yeah, so it's, it's in the body. Yeah, that's how you just want to it highlight. gets the safety strategy gets repeated over and over and over and over again, and it gets conditioned into the body. And the repetition actually changes the child's um, perception, what they are paying attention to. Uh, like if you do leaving pattern a lot, if you are leaving because you're scared, you start to pay more attention to danger than to love and comfort which i would imagine means you have <coughs> hyper sympathetic activation as kind of your regular operating um yeah. yeah yeah okay i don't think of it in those terms but i would have to agree with you yeah um more what dorsal vagal um so the the enduring pattern gets formed more in a kid who loses most of the fights. But there's another possibility, which is for a child who actually runs a big, strong flow of life energy, and for whatever reasons is inclined this way, when there are the fights with the parents, 
the kid may decide, I am not surrendering, I am fighting. And they probably will be able to win most of the fights. And what they learn to do is bring their energy up in their body and throw it out at the other person to intimidate them and to control them, to get them to back down and do it my way. So they're like the bully later they on. They become the bully. That's right. That's okay. right. So we've got leaving. We've got merging, being nice. I want you to love me. Would that be like a codependence, if you want to use that kind of language? A codependence would be the uh, psychological term yeah. for this, that the term that psychology developed from the studies with addiction, the idea being that the, the person who is dep drug dependent was the dependent one, and then the codependent spouse was helping them. Yeah, okay. But the reason the codependent spouse was helping them was that they were energetically merged. Merged, yeah. So leaving, merging, enduring, pull in and hunker down, or aggressive pattern, pull energy up and fight. I will get my way. You will get out of my way, right? And, and I want to highlight your physical movements. Yeah. They are exemplars of exactly what you're, you're talking about in terms of these five patterns, like literally <laughs> physically collapsing. Oh, yeah. Or literally expanding yourself and going after a target. Yeah. When I describe this, I try to sort of energetically tune into the, the field of each of these patterns. Yeah. yeah. I'm not as good with the first two, but I get better at it as we go, <laughs> <laughs> we go on. <laughs> and then the fifth option, which doesn't really come online until you're more like three, four, five, six, uh, and you begin to develop an inner critic, a superego in Freud's terms, um, is that you learn to contract your torso mm -hmm. in order to diminish the flow of life energy through your torso, which means you can turn down the volume of feeling inside yourself. Mm -hmm. You don't feel your inner experience so much. And instead, you can pay attention to your outer experience, your performance, and you can be a good boy or a good girl. You can perform better. So it's contract and perform. And that's the rigid pattern. Now, you talked about when you first shared your story that you found yeah. you rigid. Use that term. And is, is, is it, would you like reflect back on your life and say, oh, that's, that's one of my two or three patterns is the rigid pattern? Actually, rigid pattern is the primary pattern that I run. Okay. And, you know, if you're teaching or writing a book, it's very useful to have those skills to be able to organize the material and figure out, figure out how to present it in a really clear yeah. um, order and, and method. So I would imagine working with that body therapist you, you mentioned um, also worked energetically with you too is the perfect person to work with someone from a rigid, with a rigid pattern because you're breaking up the, the contractions. Uh, yeah. yeah, any kind of body therapy. Yeah. I mean, I've been a psychotherapist for 40 years now, and my position is that if you're doing deep, deep psychotherapy work, that's great. Also get body work yeah. Yeah. because yeah. The, the feelings and awarenesses and beliefs and stuff that are coming up to the surface, the old traumas are actually held in muscular contractions in your body and, you know, stuck um stuck tissues tissue, tissues stuck together uh that should slide easily across each other you're going to need a body worker to help relax and release those things yeah. and yeah. i've had lots of body work sessions where they you know they open me up somehow and i just burst into tears yeah no i think i, I like to highlight that how the importance of not if this is just talk therapy Right. You know, he's changing scripts and, you know, cognitive behavioral stuff does have a role to play in certain, you know, certain, mm -hmm. and, but got to bring the body in ultimately for most of everything. Uh, challenges. I would, I would say the body is more important than the mind. That if you change the body, the mind will follow. Yeah. But if you change the mind, the body doesn't follow. The body gets the mind to change back. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so we have these we have these five um, 
patterns. There's yep. the what the, the the fear response, and then this the strategy you create in order to deal with perceived or real threat. Uh, to try to feel safer. Feel safer. It's, yeah, you're not actually um, safer, but you somehow are able to feel less scared, less overwhelmed. And these things come online at various developmental times, and then become habits over time. That's just like becomes mm -hmm. your natural reaction to certain situations. But you also said something really interesting in your book too, like. You know, we can look at these things as like, oh, uh, kind of negative, although it makes sense why we create these things to protect ourselves from perceived or real threats. But you also point out in the book that that there are some superpowers that can also kind right. of- There are gifts from each pattern. Uh, yeah. And I'd love for you to, if right. you want to just mention a few of the gifts. Yeah. So a person tends to uh, continue using in childhood whatever safety strategies work for them in their family, in their culture, in their situation, right? If fighting works for you, you keep doing it. If being nice works for you, you keep doing that. If leaving works, you keep doing that. So a person gets a, a primary and a backup strategy, typically. And those get conditioned into your body. And you know what? You just asked me something and I forgot what that last part was. What was it? The last thing you asked about? The superpowers. That... Oh yeah, superpowers, the gifts. When you, when you use any of these strategies over and over and over and over again, you are practicing the skills needed to pull that off, mm. right? In order to make aggressive pattern work for you, you have to be able to bring up a huge energy and, and throw it and you have to be able to focus your will. You have to be able to almost will something into existence uh, in order to make the merging pattern work for you and get the other people to like you and take care of you. You have to be able to move your awareness to your heart center. Often a person is heart centered in the first place and that's why they do that pattern. And then you form a heart to heart connection with them and you become really good at heart to heart connection. So each one of these patterns um, requires you to practice a certain set of skills. And as you do that, you become really good at that set of skills and those become the gifts of that pattern. And, you know, obviously there are gifts for each of the ones and you mentioned too. I'd love for you just to talk a little briefly about the gifts for the leaving. Because sure. it seems seemingly very transpersonal orientation, a lot of them. Oh yeah, it, for a person whose spirit did not really claim the, the physical body of the fetus and the physical plane before birth, um, but kept bouncing out to the spirit world and coming back and bouncing out and coming back and bouncing out and coming back. That person has a lot of experience with going to the spirit world. And that then expands into experience going to all kinds of other dimensions. And the people who are really good at this tell me there are lots of other dimensions. <laughs> you know, there are lots of places to go to to get stuff. So if the person develops the skill set of going to other dimensions and getting wonderful stuff and bringing it back here, like music. One of my favorite scenes from the film Amadeus is uh, Mozart sick in bed and he's he's dictating um a concert or something to the other composer Salieri who's just writing as fast as he can and Mozart isn't methodically creating this he's just downloading it you know and that's what everybody who's good at this says about it they say look I I don't figure this out I just download it yeah. or, or another application of that skill. You've lost your car keys, right? A person like me who does rigid pattern and is very organized in his thinking is likely to stop and say, okay, when did I have my car keys? Let's start from that moment and I will walk through every move I made to find my car keys. Great. A person who's good on the psychic realm, maybe does leaving pattern, will go, okay, car keys, Hello, car keys, yell at me, call out to me, tell me where you are. They hear the response and they go get them. 
Yeah. Okay. Cool. This yeah. is great. Yeah. 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 So, so leaving pattern, a lot of psychic skill. Yeah. A lot of creativity. Yeah. Some of the most creative uh, writers in mathematics and um, poetry and novels and everything. I mean, it's clearly they're they're plugged into all kinds of other places. Exactly. People who do merging pattern, tremendous social skills gifts. If you're doing a therapy group, the person in the group who does merging pattern is tracking everyone else's inner state and who's in trouble and who needs attention right now. Yeah. So do you think that people come in incarnate with some, even before any of the, the patterns emerge out of interactions with the environment with a propensity towards the superpowers and the superpowers just kind of amplify what they already have? And the reason I ask that is because like, well, if we nourish children all the way around, all the, as much as we can, yeah. to diminish the likelihood of these things showing up, these five patterns, aren't we kind of screwing ourselves culturally with <laughs> breakthroughs in art and science and that? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think that everybody will develop some patterns, but they might wear their patterns lightly, lightly. rather than get stuck in them for decades. Okay. Okay. Right, which would be a good thing. Yeah. When you're wearing it lightly, it's easier to shift from being in whatever your patterns are to being present. And being present is the best possible state because then you still have access to all those skills and gifts. But now you can actually um, perceive what's really going on here and now and respond to that. That's a good segue. I'd like, I love to. Um contextualize this in relationships because you, you'll have a course sure. you know, um, on relationships and and you you state I, th I don't know if it's I think it was in your course um, how I don't understand how you guys see the world because the world should generate the you guys should see the way I see it but because right. you have different patterns and I'd love for you to talk about like oh okay so we all have these different patterns two, one or two or three that kind of are primary for us how does this work in relationships and eventually, I'd like for you to talk about, okay, now that we know this as an assessment tool, what do we do with it? Right. <laughs> so um, how it works in relationships is the first thing a person discovers when they start to study any map of personality, whether it's the Enneagram or the personality, pat the five personality patterns or the Myers-Briggs, any map of personality, the first thing you realize is, wow, other people are legitimately different than I am. They're not just wrong or stupid or, you know, or I'm wrong and stupid. It's not that somebody's wrong. They're actually perceiving the world in a fundamentally different way. It's almost like watching TV, but they're watching a different channel. And, you know, if you have two TV sets and they're on completely different channels, you're seeing two different worlds. Exactly. So, you know, if you're watching the the um, the scary movie channel, then everything you see is scary. And if you're watching the Hallmark channel, everything you see is about being in love and maybe there's some trouble, but it all works out within an hour. Even the ex-boyfriend's nice. <laughs> Even the ex-boyfriend's nice, yeah. Like nobody gets a, a wooden stake through their heart on the Hallmark channel, but they sure do in the in the scary movies the horror movies i mean imagine that literally different people are watching different channels and so they are perceiving the world in a fundamentally different way than you are and even though they're speaking to you using the same words you use those words are referencing different experiences for them yeah. than they would reference for you yeah. so that's the first thing getting that way, wow, people can legitimately be different. And my way is not the only way. Yeah. It is a way, but it's not the one and only way. So then what I need to do is learn, well, how is the, are these other people, say my spouse, my child, someone important to me, how do they experience the world? And how can I understand that and begin to experience the world a little more like they do so that I can be closer to them and understand them better. That's a huge discovery. 
you have exercises in your in your book yeah well that teach people how to kind of embody those different perspectives or patterns i've i've attempted that yeah yeah and i don't expect anybody you know to spend an hour or a hundred hours of practice and suddenly be as good at a set of skills as someone who's been doing it for 20 years, night yeah. and day, yeah. you know, yeah. right? You just don't have the hours in my friend, um, but you can get a taste of it. Yeah. And then uh, I've seen this a lot in, uh, in couples therapy. The couples have, the, the, the couple comes into therapy because they have some argument that they've had for five years or 10 years or 20 years, and they just can't solve it. And it always just spirals into bad something and they can't get out. And what they haven't realized is that, first of all, they are caught in different personality patterns. And what one of them does to try to feel safer is the same thing that makes the other person feel less safe. So then they do what they try to, they used to try to feel safer and that makes the first person feel less safe. So it's a, it's a self-reinforcing. Yeah, that makes sense. Bad thing. Yeah. And when they can ex understand that cycle, they can start to unpack it and realize, oh, wait a minute. When I said that you heard you heard it this way mm. it meant this to you and then they can learn from each other well what can i do instead yeah. that will help you feel safer because that's everybody's goal how can i help you feel safer yeah. my favorite quote from uh stephen porges mm -hmm. is if you want to improve the world start by making people feel safer yeah, yeah. i absolutely agree with him on that yeah exactly that's great. So, all right. So, so that makes sense how you might work with a couple, right? Help each person understand how the other person does what they do and how it spirals the triggering system mm -hmm. and to give them new uh, strategies to deal with this. They're not going back to their original as maybe as, as strongly going back to their, their, their survival strategy, which triggers the other person. Learning to get out of pattern themselves so they can come back to being present and then operate from there. Got it. Cool. How about if you're working with an individual? And you're like, okay, I, I, I've assessed you and you, you're, you're a lever with some rigidity or you're aggressive with a little bit of merging or whatever yeah. like the, yeah. the combinations might be. What okay. Do you do the first thing I do is not turn them into a noun. Nice. I don't use the term, you're a lever, you're a merger. Nice. A lot nice. of people do that. It's very common uh -huh. because after all, in the Enneagram, in the Myers-Briggs, in most of the way we think about it, that is how English language works. Mm -hmm. um, I stick with uh, with it being a more of a, a verb or at least adjective situation of, okay, uh, as a emerging patterned person mm -hmm. or a leaving patterned person, mm -hmm. a person whose body has been conditioned this way, mm -hmm. how do we help you recognize when you've gone into that pattern? And what steps can you take to get out of that path? Nice. Okay. To yeah. come back to being present. Okay. That make uh, that makes complete sense, and I, and I definitely appreciate the the adjective of the verb approach as opposed to the noun approach, because the noun approach is like you turn them into a rock, and, and, and you know people think that's who they are, then they're like most likely going to push against it, the thoughts of wanting to change. Well, that's just yeah. fine. Yeah. And English is a very noun centered language. Yeah. I've heard from linguists that there are lots of other languages which are much more verb centered. Hmm. Frankly, I, I would like to try that. I'm not <laughs> learning any new languages, but uh, I think it would be a good idea. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so that's that's what you'd work with individuals. And I could imagine this there's, it would have, do you, do you do this with groups too? So this could be a really powerful tool. Not oh, absolutely. Like in any kind of life situation, any time that you want to understand yourself better and be able to shift yourself out of old, um, old automatic patterns, mm -hmm. which come from the past and don't necessarily apply to the present moment and probably aren't helping, 
yeah. to get out of that automatic response back to being present where you can figure out a response that actually does work in the present. So it sounds like it's a very freedom oriented. So it's, you're going from reactive state to a, a, a choice or a re Exactly. Okay. Yeah. A presence-based choice. Awesome. Exactly. And to, to freedom from the old trauma, because the trauma stuck in your body is what's fueling those reactions. The more trauma you still have stuck in your body, the more fuel there is. And every time uh, somebody, you know, pushes that button or pulls that trigger, you have a big energy thing in your body and you automatically go into that behavior. Like it's not conscious. It's not voluntary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, we do stuff we didn't want to do yeah. that we realize isn't helping and we can't stop because it's being fueled by the old trauma. So we have to clear that trauma out of the body. What a great system <laughs> and, and a fantastic book. Um, and I know you, besides the book, you also have various kind of online programs that you teach based on, based yes. on work. Um, can you talk about you know, where people can find the book, where can we talk sure. about the different programs you offer? So the book is available in all the usual places where you can buy books. And there's, you know, the physical hard copy, there's the ebook version, there's the audio book version. And there's also, of course, a, um, a website for it, which has exactly the same name as the book, <laughs> the5personalitypatterns.com. Um, and on that website, uh, there's a whole lot of different resources and stuff you can uh, read and look through. And there's a, one of the menus is called trainings, you know, help and trainings. And under that, there are a bunch of uh, free webinars and um, courses, recorded video courses that I have taught and recorded and a person can now um, enroll in, register for and, and participate in. In including the one I mentioned earlier on relationships. Exactly. Yeah. The, the most recent one is called How to Have Better Relationships. Yeah. Um, the one before that is called How to Create a Self. My contention is that psychology has been on the wrong track for 100 years about how to create a self. We've been thinking that it was about thoughts and feelings. Mm -hmm. And my, my um, assertion is that that's secondary. The main thing is a felt sense of the core of your your torso, from the crown of your head down to your perineum, because that's the part of your body where you are the most you. And that's the part to reference to find out, am I hungry? Am I thirsty? Uh, do I want to eat this candy bar? Do I want to eat this peach? Do I want to take this job? Do I want to move to the mountains? Do I want to marry this person? Am I in love here? All those answers are in the core of your body. They're not in your hand. They're not in your foot. They're in the core of your body. And if you are aware of that, if you're able to tune into that, you can reference that and find out what's really going on with you. And that's where actually where a, um, an embodied sense of self arises for mm. a person. I love that. Yeah. Stephen, I definitely that's, your time. I've enjoyed this. Okay. Let me Thank you much. Sorry if we went long here. No, no, it was great. No, you touched everything that I wanted to touch upon. Is there any last comments you'd like to make? I don't think so. Okay. I, I certainly am grateful for your interest in this, your awareness of how valuable it is, and, and your work in spreading the word on it. Awesome. I mean, I've, I've known some people who teach this material in schools, particularly high schools, where, you know, kids are at the age where they're trying to figure out, like, who am I and how do I fit in? Um, I, I wish every student in the in the nation was learning this stuff and actually every every adult around the world I think we'd have a lot fewer fights and wars and we'd be we'd do much better at getting along with each other from, from your lips to God's ears maybe so I hope thank you thank you sir thank you Michael <laughs>